straight ahead on CCX News. The past comes alive with a new museum in Golden Valley. Plus, a local startup in Plymouth. Some people raise kids and have families. We have fermenters and kombucha. Is brewing success five gallons at a time. But first, primaries are here. What you need to know before you vote. CCX News starts right now. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. The primary election is upon us and Minnesotans will soon head to the polls to make important decisions on who will be on the November ballot for important races such as Governor, Attorney General and U.S. House of Representatives. And Tuesday's primary will also determine some local races such as Brooklyn Park Mayor. So how many people will head to the polls? Delane Cleveland joins us with more on that. Delane. Alex and Shannon, one thing that's clear about this year's primary election is that Hennepin County has already broken an early voting record. As of Monday morning, Hennepin County has received more than 31,000 absentee ballots. During the 2016 primary, the county only, re only received 9,000 ballots. But experts say that early voting numbers won't necessarily translate to high voter turnout on Tuesday. Now. A lot of people are saying, well, does early voting mean a lot more people are going to vote? There's no, there's no necessary correlation between early voting and overall turnout. It may just simply be that more people will vote early because um, they find it convenient and turnout isn't affected by it, or it could be that early voting is a sign of an overall increase in, 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 in excitement about the election this year. Hamlin University professor David Schultz says that over a 30-year period, the number of people who have showed up to the polls to vote in Minnesota primaries has gone down dramatically. In the early 90s, about a third of registered voters voted in the primaries, but he says a 20% turnout for this election would be considered pretty good. As for the record number of early voters, Schultz says it's likely due to the fact that more people understand how the process works and because the statewide races have drawn interest. Now, but with new allegations, coming out against Attorney General candidate Keith Ellison and gubernatorial candidate Lori Swanson over the past few days. People are also starting to see the potential downside of early voting. One of the risks that you run with early voting is the fact that new facts might come out and make you change how you want to vote. And under Minnesota law, if you early voted, you could change your vote up until seven days before the primary. But in a story like this, which is literally breaking in the last 24, the 48 to 72 hours, voters lose that ability to be able to do that. Meanwhile, polls open Tuesday morning at 7 o'clock and close at 8 p.m. If you want to take a look at your sample ballot before casting your vote, we have a link on our website at ccxmedia.org. Alex and Shannon. All right, thanks a lot, Delane. A close call for three Maple Grove police officers on Friday. They were responding to a house on a report of a woman not breathing and a strong smell of gas coming from the garage. Police say the first officer on the scene may have been overcome by the fumes. Two other officers had to pull him and the woman out of the house. The unnamed adult woman died. The three officers were treated at an area hospital for non-life-threatening injuries and released that evening. A police spokesman today said all three are doing fine. The medical examiner and Hennepin County Crime Lab are investigating. You don't have to look far to see businesses trying to lure people to work. One of the biggest problems that employers are having right now is finding enough qualified workers workers are going to be increasingly hard to find and we need to take advantage of every worker we we have available to us and that would certainly include looking at our our younger workforce baby boomer retirements and a low unemployment rate are the cause of a worker shortage that's affecting industries across the state it is a problem that it's expected to last for another 10 years so the pipeline of workers is important so how are our young adults and minority populations being trained for the future if you make an investment in me and my community and i see that you genuinely care about our development as a unit you've got us for life we investigate the issue of how to fill the worker shortage in a series of stories called Filling the Gap, Teens and the Worker Shortage that starts Tuesday on CCX News. 
A group in Golden Valley wants you to take a closer look at local history. It's been a long journey, but the Golden Valley Historical Society is about to open up a new museum telling the story of their city. We got a sneak peek. It's hard to imagine, but the hustle and bustle that is Golden Valley today used to be nothing but farmland and fields. Step into the new wing off the side of the Little White Church on Golden Valley Road, and you can get a better taste of Golden Valley's agricultural past and much, much more. We've got uh, the Garden Club uh, display with the uh, Lilac Queen. From Lilac Queens to Golden Valley High School memorabilia, this is a collection that used to sit in the basements and storage units of Golden Valley Historical Society members. Now it has a home and tells a story. We hope it offers them an opportunity to understand their history in Golden Valley and become more conversant about its history. Longtime Secretary Don Anderson told us members wanted to tell stories about Ewald Dairy and the first Byerly store, but they also wanted to tell the stories you might not know, like how the suburbs struggled with civil rights. A black musician played at a restaurant in Golden Valley and he was stopped every time he came to work by a police officer for some sort of equipment violation. And after the third time, he filed a lawsuit. The court ruled for the musician. It's one of the many history lessons you can learn here, thanks in large part to the dedication of members like Ed Jordan, who was a local businessman. When he died, we found out in his will that he left $400,000 for us, which means that we could start building this building immediately. There's so much to learn here. Members even included a display in the restroom. Two restrooms, and you really have to go in there because some, there's educational materials in there too. <laughs> Displays will change over time, and like any students of history, the volunteers are remembering the lessons of the past while keeping an eye on the future. This is not the end of the project. This is the beginning of the project. Now we have to have volunteers who will be the greeters. The grand opening will be on Saturday, September 22nd, and after that you can visit the museum on Thursdays and Saturdays. And of course, it would not be a visit to the Little White Church we're still without talking about the street signs that are for sale by the Golden Valley Historical Society. To date, they've sold more than 1,100 old street signs to people all around the country, and they still have about 1,000 left to sell. The signs are $25 each. And in Crystal, a group of residents have recently formed a historical society as well. This has been a long process, but the group gained nonprofit status in July. This month, they started asking for donations connected to Crystal's history. As we're still trying to just get a grasp on how much um, documentation, how, how much is still in the community that hasn't been lost or become part of somebody else's historical society or museum. The donations must be formally accepted by the Crystal Historical Society. They are currently using space at the Crystal Community Center. Bibles for Missions Thrift Store has been in the city of Crystal since 1997 and the nonprofit recently expanded. With that expansion comes an increased need for volunteers. Meredith Hackler shows us how you can help their cause. The Bibles for Mission Thrift Store serves more than just the community of Crystal. We reach out to the community both north, south, east and west and it's interesting that uh, a lot of people come in here that are hurting. And those people are the reason many dedicated volunteers give their time to the store. I'm one of the main cashiers and sometimes I'll have a, a mother with four or five little kids and it's back to school time and she will tell me with tears in her eyes that if she didn't come here the kids would not have clothes for school. But finding those volunteers can be a challenge. It's a, it's a difficult thing and a challenge. While the store may seem like just a place for people to shop at a fair price, its purpose does much more. Our mission is to provide quality used merchandise and the profits are used to um, provide for mission work in Eastern Europe. Our store has uh, Bulgaria as our primary um, support group. This is one of the things that we're unique about here is that we're not just a thrift store, we're uh, kind of like a mission and we're not, we're not proselyting anyone but we will also 
take time to talk about who Jesus is, and that's our mission and why we're here. That mission is what volunteers say makes donating their time worthwhile. I have a lot of people that say, you work really hard and you don't get paid. That just doesn't seem right. And I tell people, we don't get paid monetarily, but we get blessings you would not imagine. In Crystal, Meredith Hackler, CCX News. If you would like to volunteer, you can apply at the store or call the number on your screen. Still ahead on CCX News, the sweet and slightly sour taste of its success. We check in with a growing kombucha tea brewing company. Plus, new coaches at Park Center and Champlin Park get started on the opening day of high school football practice. But first, cooler temperatures tomorrow with showers and maybe a thunderstorm in the afternoon. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Over the last several years, kombucha tea has grown in popularity nationwide with several new local producers on the scene in Minnesota. In this week's Business Matters report, a Plymouth entrepreneur and his business partner are the latest pair to get into the brewing of fermented tea. The Good Acre, a commercial kitchen in Falcon Heights. It's gone really well. There's a dream that's brewing. We've both been in corporate America all our careers, so we kind of have an idea of how to how to go about doing things. So we're like, you know, we kind of can figure this out. General Mills co-workers Carmen Bushy and Justin Lilly. Raspberry ginger lemon is kind of like the, the go-to for a lot of people. It seems very approachable. Are the duo behind this young startup business. Some people raise kids and have families. We have fermenters and kombucha. We're in the warehouse. This is where we store all of our five and a half gallon fermenters. On nights and weekends, the founders of Nifty Brewing Company are busy with batches of their kombucha tea. Typically, we put in first fermentation between three and four weeks. From there is when you add your whole fruits and fresh herbs. And this one is our raspberry lemon ginger. For the uninitiated, kombucha is a fermented sweet tea with a culture of bacteria and yeast. You should expect a little tart, kind of slightly vinegary smell. That's it's part of the natural fermentation process and you will see a little bit of debris uh, in your um, bottle because that is the uh, mother culture, kind of like what you see in apple cider vinegar. Um, those are your probiotics, those are your healthy, healthy bacteria, enzymes. While the drink's health benefits are still up for debate, growing popularity of kombucha is undisputed. I would have to go with the white grape lemon. Yeah, white grape lemon. As Colin Edmondson restocks the shelves at Lake Winds Food Co-op, where Nifty brand kombucha is sold, the amount of product being made has grown from a couple hundred bottles a month last year to more than a thousand bottles a month this summer. It's fun being part of something from the ground up and being part of every step of the way, so it's been a lot of fun. The goal is to keep growing this business. Ideally, the founders would love to get their beverage into local restaurants and bars, where they hope new customers will have the same reaction Justin Lilly's mom did when she unknowingly helped name the company. She actually heard of kombucha and we were surprised by that and she took a sip of ours and was like, oh, that's nifty. <laughs> Bottles of nifty kombucha sell for around four and a half to five dollars a piece. Coming up, blues, brews, and barbecues. A local festival benefits Habitat for Humanity and also other charities. But first, we pay a visit to the 37th annual game fair. John Jacobson is in next. I'm John Jacobson with sports. Well, where did summer go? High school athletes in a variety of fall sports are back on the practice fields, courts, trails, and pools today. Set, hut, hut. It was the first day of football practice at Champlain Park High School. The Rebels are starting the 2018 season. Just the third head coach in the program's history. Nick Keenan takes over for Mike Corton. Most of the players have spent the past couple of months working out together and going through the Rebels' summer strength and conditioning program. Still, there is something special about the first official day of practice for a new season. Obviously, all the people that are here are super passionate about playing, so it's, it's really exciting. And especially with the numbers that are coming out, it's, it's really um, it's refreshing to see, so we're all pretty excited. Uh, the first day of practice, uh, you know, 
now it's required that they be here. So that's, that's, that's exciting, but it's exciting for me because I'm kind of back where I started. So I'm blessed with some really good assistant coaches and kind of the foundation already set. Try to change a few things up from the things I've learned from being away. So I'm really excited. Well, more of a season preview story on the Rebels in the coming week here on CCX News. Champlain Park's first game is at home August 30th against Eastridge. Like Champlain Park, Park Center enters the 2018 season with a new head football coach. Former Pirates assistant and player Jordan Salas takes the reins this fall. The Pirates spent much of their first day testing the conditioning of the players. Numbers are up this fall and more players signed up even today. An exciting time for the Pirates as they get set for the season. Yeah, we've been working on in the summer, but uh, especially with the uh, first day of camp, you got a lot more, a lot more kids, a lot more people coming and showing out. Um, I think our number, no, numbers have doubled since the summer. Basically, I want to see that how it shaped the guys are. You know, are they ready to go? Which some are, some aren't. But I think uh, installation, installing the offense and defense, hit the ground running, having the kids understand what we want to, what we want to run and how we want to do it. Teams have a couple more days of conditioning practices before they can practice in full pads. Park Center opens at home against Cooper August 31st, a game you'll be able to see live here on CCX. As we hit mid-August, many hunters and outdoorsmen are gearing up for the fall. We paid a visit to Game Fair to check out the sights and sounds. There is one more big weekend of Game Fair this coming Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And that is it for sports. We're back in a moment. And we will leave you today with a quick look at the Blues, Brews, and Barbecue Festival from this weekend. See you tomorrow.